Welcome to lecture number 41. This is topic 4.13, the Society of the South in the Early Republic. This is the last historical topic before we do a big roundup of the entire historical period. The theme for this topic is geography and the environment. The learning objective is explain how geographic and environmental factors shaped the development of the South from 1800 to 1848. And the first key concept is Southern business leaders continued to rely on the production and export of traditional agricultural staples, contributing to the growth of a distinctive Southern regional identity. The agricultural staples that were grown were rice, tobacco, and later on cotton. With the growth of the cotton industry due to the invention of the cotton gin, Southern regional identity was further ensconced on this agricultural identity. There were very few large cities in the South. The largest city in the South before the Civil War was the city of New Orleans, and it was only the fifth largest city in the country. The next largest cities in the South, like Charleston and Richmond, didn't even come close to the numbers of New Orleans or compared to some of the other large northern urban areas. Cotton became the most important agricultural product. It made up the majority of the South's exports to Britain and to northern textile factories. It made up two-thirds of all of the U.S. exports to Britain. And since it was greatly responsible for the wealth that existed in the South, it took on the nickname King Cotton. The lure of profits from cotton encouraged more Southerners to move further west to expand their plantations. As Southerners moved into the Western Territory, the institution of slavery also moved with them. The next key concept says, in the South, although the majority of Southerners owned no slaves, most leaders argued that slavery was part of the Southern way of life. In the South, they called slavery the peculiar institution. This was a euphemism that tried to hide the evils of slavery. From the year 1800 to 1860, the year before the start of the Civil War, the enslaved population quadrupled from 1 million to 4 million. This happened at a time that the population of the United States was doubling every 25 years. So there was a parallel natural increase happening for the enslaved population, despite the barriers that enslaved people faced to a normal family life. If two enslaved people wanted to get married, they would have to get the permission of the enslaver. Other times, enslaved women were used to breed more enslaved people. There were times in which an enslaved woman could marry a free man, or vice versa, and the status of the child born out of their marriage would follow the status of the woman, based on the southern slave codes. Now for the enslavers. 75% of the population did not practice slavery in the South. A lot of these plantations and agricultural enterprises in the South were worked on by white families who did not have enslaved people on their plantation. Most plantations that practiced slavery had less than 20 people in bondage, and a very small, very wealthy, aristocratic class owned the majority of the slaves in the South. But why was it that the South overall was so strong in their support for slavery? Well, the very wealthy aristocratic class was the one that had the most influence in state politics and state governments. They convinced the rest of the South that this was necessary, that this was something that was a part of the South's economic success. Poor whites that were at the very bottom of the social classes supported slavery because they hoped to one day attain the type of wealth that would allow them to purchase enslaved people. Thus, they didn't want slavery to be abolished before that happened. It wasn't such a flawed notion for them to adopt. As discussed in a previous lecture, economic mobility was possible across different generations. As people moved west for more land, slavery expanded as well. There was a shift of the slave population being concentrated in the upper southern states and then moving down to the Mississippi River and that surrounding area. The map on the screen shows the concentration of enslaved people in the year 1860. The darker areas are the places with the highest concentration. It's mostly along the Mississippi River. The line graph on the screen shows the percentage of change over the years of the enslaved population as a percentage of the total population across the southern states. It shows that the percentages in the upper southern states like Maryland or Delaware dip, and then all the states that are in the deep south see an increase of their enslaved populations. States like South Carolina that are on the border between the Deep South and the Upper South also see a huge increase. Cities like Charleston become centers for the domestic slave trade. The last key concept says, as overcultivation depleted arable land in the Southeast, slaveholders began relocating their plantations to more fertile lands west of the Appalachians, where the institution of slavery continued to grow. Southerners moved west because they had overcultivated the lands in the Upper South and Southeast. The cotton they were planting depleted the soil of its nutrients and would yield smaller harvest each growing season. Those that were moving out west with enslaved people were bound by the Missouri Compromise. The northern boundary of slavery was the southern border of the state of Missouri, extending all the way out west. By 1845, most southwestern territories were added to the Union through the annexation of Texas and the Mexican Cession. That's a result of the Mexican-American War. The debate on whether slavery would be allowed in these new territories will be the source of growing tensions between the North and the South that we'll go over more deeply in the next unit. The internal slave trade continues to grow. 
Enslavers of the Upper South would sell their enslaved people south and southwest. It would be done in the large cities of the South like Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans, Louisiana. These two cities were the biggest centers for the slave trade. Auction houses would dominate certain neighborhoods of the city, and enslaved people would be displayed on the streets for people passing by to examine. In New Orleans in particular, auctions would take place in really grand hotels like the St. Louis Hotel pictured on the screen. And finally, for the recap, slavery became more ingrained into Southern society in the antebellum. In this period, more and more Southern people come to believe that it is part of the way of life and that if slavery is taken away, then it was an attack on Southern society as a whole. The South relied heavily on agriculture and cotton plantations. And finally, as Southern farms moved West, they took their enslaved people with them, expanding the institution of slavery. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.